Yes, we are live. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Etienne Eichenberger, the moderator of our session this afternoon. I'm here in Geneva, Switzerland, and we are here with Suzanne in Manhattan, uh, with Sylvia in Zurich, with Marcello, which is a world traveler, so he's astonishingly in Switzerland for a couple of hours, uh, probably even more, as he said us in the preparation conversations, and also Michael in uh, New York. We'll be discussing this afternoon together the sessions uh, where we were invited to talk about and to reflect with you. I see that we have our audience which is starting to join us, but I think we would like to start on time as I know also the session is recorded and so probably it's going to be also used by further people later on uh, to catch up on the fascinating topic. Our topic is that has been there has never been a better time for philanthropic giving. That's our sessions. You certainly know that, and you also know who is on stage. I will not present each and every one formally, because I think with all the social media, everyone can jump in and see. I think we will preserve more time for conversations. Um, and so uh, I look forward for our conversations. Um, what we will be looking this afternoon um, in our conversations, beside the introductions that you have seen, is we would like to reflect on how giving has changed since COVID happens. We think that actually many things have changed and we have enough step back to try to reflect on what has changed. And by giving, as you will see from our conversation, it's not only about money, it's about talent, it's about skills, it's about networks, it's about personal commitment. So, and uh, we come with a great audience of a growth panel of different backgrounds. So that's the one element in our conversations. The other ones which we also be looking at is how true is that that there's been no better time to give. And uh, our reflection will be to make sure we get uh, a perspective across each other on that. But we also look at what might be the trends as 2021 and 22 uh, are year made of uncertainty uh, uh, and the context is certainly changing. So that's going to be our conversations of the afternoon. We will have no formal presentation, but conversations. So do feel free also to engage by asking questions. We'd be delighted actually to get uh, some kind of engagement uh, for wherever you are. Um, before I start with the conversations, I want to just say quickly three things to introduce our debate. I think the one thing we've experienced over the years, uh, the last 18 months, is the States is back. Uh, let's be frank, no one had expected 10 years ago that the government and state would play such a crucial role in providing public good. Uh, the state is certainly back, and so that's going to change a lot of things. Uh, it's highlighted in the sections states of more debt, but state of more active players, uh, and these raise expectations. Um, we also think that actually the uncertainty is not what we celebrated 31st of uh, December last year. It's going to be lasting for 21 and 22. The vaccine is certainly growing, uh, but uh, the uncertainty is still remaining. I was speaking with my business partners this morning based in Vietnam, and Vietnam, which was quite a quiet year, is going through rough time. The country is closing down. There is a new uh, variant raising there. So we'll see that uncertainty will remain for quite some time, so no planes going in or out. Uh, and Vietnam is just an illustration of 80 million countries, but there are probably many others. So uncertainty will remain. And the last one, which we'll be digging into, and that's going to help me to ask the first questions, is that the needs are certainly growing, as we will see further on, the fragility of our societies, the social fabric, the economic systems, as shown over the last 18 months, certainly uh, growing fragility, while it's also very strong resilience, and we will also have sign of hope in our conversations. But I was just looking at three figures that strikes me before I was going and preparing the call, is that on, you know, uh, access to food, uh, there is an estimation that 130 million uh, more people are getting a crisis in accessing food. Uh, I also, also raised that 420, 422 million of people have grown into severe poverty, uh, mostly in the South, which raised Southeast Asia and Africa. But we've also experienced that fragility can be in other city countries. That's one of the topics we're going to be addressing as well. And the last figures is uh, nearly 600 million kids had had no access to schools or no possibility to get into education. Just three figures, they're enormous. Uh, philanthropy is not only about millions, it's about also smaller figures, but just to remind us that the needs are growing. And we hope that our conversation will be also insightful and specific so that each of us can enjoy actual practical experience. So that's my 
short introductions to our conversations. And uh, I'm going to start uh, unpolitely, but uh, with Marcello, uh, because Marcello has a unique platform with the Wisdom Accelerators, where he has, he hear so many voices. And among the voices he's hearing are the next gen. So I'd like to hear from you, Marcello, what have you heard from the younger generations, uh, which in some countries were put aside, in some countries uh, uh, was not able to go to school. What do you hear from them about the last 12 months? And what do you think it has, what kind of impact it has on giving and philanthropy? Uh, thanks for the entrance in. Uh, a couple of angles that could be uh, assessed there. Uh, I think that the younger generations, my focus is on teenagers between 13 and 17, right? The whole idea of wisdom accelerator for youth is to catch them while they're young so that they can benefit from more years of being wiser uh, down the line. And uh, they are suffering a lot, right? Because uh, if you're below that age group, uh, most of the social interactions happen at home. Between 13 and 17, your parents and your siblings, they become less and less relevant and your social groups at school become more uh, important. So I think that um, their capacity for compassion is somewhat diminished because uh, they are trying to struggle to understand what they're going through and uh, what is that that is missing that um, they used to have that is now gone at least um, uh, for the time being. And um, that's the, uh, the element of, uh, okay, you know, whatever you had before is no longer there. And younger people, they don't have the uh, renewal uh, experience. I mean, seriously, I'm uh, wearing a, a recycled T-shirt. But uh, the renewal here being, uh, as adults, we have gone through uh, good and bad times. And uh, we know that this is a circle of fortune. Eventually, okay, I'm having a bad day, but tomorrow is going to be a better one. Uh, younger people do not have that. So I think that they need a, a huge amount of support and also clarification saying, look, th this is what the future could entail and don't lose hope, right? So you have to focus very much on the hope element and getting them involved in philanthropy would be a fantastic way to feed them with compassion, right? Not with the pity or mercy, but because they're you know, in pain, you know, mental pain in most cases, uh, thankfully, no, nothing uh, much worse than that in the vast majority of situations. But we can try to gently guide them into say, okay, you're bored, you're confused, you don't know how to use the time you have at hand, and uh, your um, foundational elements are no longer there, like you know the social group and going to school and having regular hours. Why don't you use this energy to help others? Like you can donate your time, you can donate your effort, you can just learn about new things that you couldn't before. And um, hopefully, this is something that is going to get them to grow even uh, um, the faster once the pandemic is over. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I mean, in, in 2019, we lived so much with the Friday of the Futures, where they were engaged so much in the street uh, for or against the environment's uh, depredations. It's all a question of perspective. So it's good to hear that actually there is that energy. Uh, Sylvia, you work with Co-Impact. Uh, you have been a, a, a very important element of the development of that initiative. And in, in, in a way, you have a a unique uh, observations. I often think of you uh, having that unique position of being both in a balloon to see far and the uh, and the ground on earth and to know the reality. Can you let us know a little bit your insight about the last 18 months, what you've seen? Uh, and you can quickly introduce Co-Impact if you wish, if that's helpful for our conversations. Yes, for sure. Thank, thank you so much for, for having me today. Um, so first I would say that Co-Impact is a global collaborative focused on systems change, on inclusive and just societies. Uh, uh, in countries in the global south. So essentially what we do is two things. First is we bring together a group of philanthropists to collaborate. Um, to date, we have over 40 funders, philanthropists and foundations from 16 different countries that pool their funding. And we use this funding to support the visions for systems change of our program partners, which is how we choose to call um, the organizations that we give grants to. So it's, it's a different type of philanthropy. Um, it's not the traditional model of an endowed foundation that gives relatively small and restricted grants, but rather it's a collaborative where the funders come together and really support in ways that are longer term, more flexible, um, and focused on a significant change, what we call systems change, the, the organizations and the leaders on the ground that are at the forefront of change in their own countries and their communities. Um, and in terms of what we've seen in the, in the last uh, few, few months and, and with, the, with the COVID pandemic, 
First is the fact that many funders like, like us have um, been offering quite a lot of flexibility to the program partners that they work with or to the grantees that they support. So being flexible in terms of timelines, in terms of areas to focus, in terms of additional funding. A lot of funders also, you know, took away any reporting requirements and just said to their partners, you know, what do you need um, and how can we help you even more right now? But secondly, what, we, what we've seen and, and that really plays into the work that we're doing is that COVID had really, has really exposed all the weaknesses in the systems, um, not only in the, in the health system, but in the education, the economic opportunity systems, and also the, the inordinate burden that women and girls have been suffering um, throughout the pandemic. So in a way, it, uh, unfortunately, in some ways, this, this pandemic has exposed the need to focus on strengthening the systems. And this is precisely the type of philanthropy uh, that we practice at Growing Back and that we hope uh, that many more will move towards. Sylvia, uh, working with 40 funders gives you the opportunity to engage with each of them. Would you say that in the last 18 months, uh, you have seen more or less of their time attentions, uh, their financial supports to the initiative you lead? Have, have, what would you say has changed in terms of, of their attentions, if you can give us some insight? Yeah, so I will, I will answer the question, but not about the 40 funders that we have at Coimpact, because I don't think they're representative of, of the, mm -hmm. the world of philanthropy. So if you, if you look at the crisis of, of um, 2008, um, in the year after, global giving went down anywhere between 7 and 11%, depending on who you count and what you count, right? Now, fast forward to uh, COVID. And in general, it seemed like a lot of funders were increasing their funding as a result of COVID. At least they were adding more flexibility. In terms of uptick in giving, it's very difficult to calculate because a number of funders, especially especially the largest ones, just repackaged the funding that they were going to do anyway and just framed it more as COVID, right? So I think there was an uptick in giving. Uh, clearly, lots of people in different parts of the world were giving more locally as well to their own communities and, and the causes close to them in, with respect to COVID. So I think there was some level of uptick in, in funding, uh, but not very significant. And what I fear is that this year and next, we're going to see actually the dip, um, the amount of funding going down, right? You anticipate the next topics, but that's good insight. But <laughs> if, before we move there, I mean, you used just now a word, uh, uh, Sylvia, giving more locally. Uh, with Suzanne, uh, you and your husband, you are very actively engaged in the community uh, near the Hudson Valley. You correct me if I'm, 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 I'm doing that rightly. Uh, and it would be useful if you can share, uh, uh, as you've been very grounded in your communities and you have been running very pilot initiatives. Would you would you say so? You are doing more locally, or would you observe more people giving locally? Is that the reality also uh, in in your communities where you operate? Yeah, and you definitely. can introduce a little bit of work you do, if you may. Sure, of course. So um, we run um, Utopia Holdings and Utopia Foundation, and we focus on impact driven initiatives. and um, And our folk, you know, we, we realized is with the funding that we have, if we focus on um, very locally and smaller initiatives, we can make a much bigger impact than say giving to large organizations. And um, you know, in the last you know eighteen months, two years or so, we've really you know recognized the value of you know how 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 many people in our community you know right next door are suffering and how much of an impact um, we can make as a result and and we've been doing that on a number of levels you know and this is what um Sylvia had mentioned in terms of being flexible and responsive you know people would come to us and um you know we had the mayor call us and say that um, there were there were students who weren't able to attend school because they didn't have access to Wi-Fi. So what we immediately did was we got in touch with the telephone company and we had them drop ship um, Wi-Fi hotspots um, to 50 families so that those students could actually attend school. So that's an example of you know super quick being able to turn around, being responsive to the community, and where relatively little money can make a huge impact. Um, the biggest initiative that we've been working on. 
um, is um, Hudson Up, which is a um, uh, a UBI pilot. It's actually the first small city UBI pilot, and that's happening in the city of Hudson. And um, we have um, 25 participants. So quite small uh, relative to the millions you're talking about, but um, 25 participants are each receiving $500 a month for a period of five years. Um, and, um, you know, we're hoping that, and we're actually seeing that other philanthropists and, and um, other um, cities nearby and across the U.S. and hopefully the world um, are following suit. Yeah, inspire. I mean, being inspired and inspiring others. Uh, you, you feel that actually uh, there is, as you know, you you say you're just in Manhattan. Do you see uh, more tractions towards philanthropy? I mean, have you have you appetite from your uh, relatives, friends, and community you are in of the work you do? What do you find, or have you been like any others, close home and Zoom whenever we could, but not every time, all the time? I mean, what's your feeling about about whether people. Yeah, yeah, what do people think of your engagement and the appetite to learn from, from the work you do and you, the way you're committed? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that people are getting inspired, um, recognizing that they can, they can make a huge difference, you know, in the neighborhood that they're, they're living. Um, one of the things I am seeing, I'm, I'm also very much interested in supporting women, um, and BIPOC, um, folks. Um, and, you know, whether it's via philanthropy or also investments, um, we're seeing that, you know, folks are, are really sort of crossing the line between philanthropy and investments and, and, and are, are, are starting to really invest locally in their community. And that, that, that blurry line I'm seeing um, happening more and more. Good. Thank you. Um, Michael's uh, your neighbor with Suzanne. Um, while you will share later on a little bit more about your personal commitment. Um, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Um, um, very also in your unique positions because you you work also with families and have you seen from your perspective uh, that last eighteen months has changed something? Uh, while you know, as a European, uh, we always have great admiration how the Americans are actually uh, embedded in philanthropy in the work of life are very natural things, which is I think a bit of a different cultural mindset, which is to be praised in that conversation we have today. What would you say if things change last 18 months from your perspective? Thank you, Etienne. It's great to be with this group. Uh, what I've seen that's changed in the families that I advise and, and work with is during the crisis specifically, a lot of families who tend to be strategic givers uh, have made some exceptions and really engaged in a lot of tactical giving where they've seen immediate areas of need. And, and of course, the second thing that's been mentioned already is that the crisis has highlighted areas of need, particularly in uh, communities of color, uh, in the education system that you mentioned, and in a number of other high need areas, uh, which were not prepared even before the crisis and where the crisis exacerbated uh, a lot of the challenges in those communities. Would you like to take then a specific example? I mean, you raised the, the specific communities. I know that you've also a personal commitment in one of them. Can you share a little bit uh, the works when you're doing with that communities and, and, and light high to eventually things have changed from your perspective? As, as beside your advisor, you also you have personal commitment. That's what I mean. Yes, guess. yes, thank you. So, so I am a board member of a charity called WISE, working in support of education. And among other things, we provide financial literacy education in a thousand high schools around the country and also to victims of uh, domestic abuse and survivors of domestic abuse. And what we noticed is that uh, there's 50 states in this country. They each have their own educational policies for their high schools. Some of them require financial literacy before you graduate from high school. And those continued working with my charity on their programs. And those that didn't require, as they were going through so much disruption, uh, you know, trying to understand how to help kids remotely or in different configurations within school, they kind of let uh, financial literacy and other priorities drop. Thank you. Does anyone of you have questions to the first round of conversations? Or I see that we've also at least Bastian makes him with us. I mean, does one of you have questions? Or I'm, I'm, I have many more, but I also want to make sure you can engage. I have a comment. Please, please do so. Comments, yeah. 
It's more of an asterisk um, for Susanna. I have to introduce you to a good friend of mine who's a PhD from Stanford. Uh, he lives in uh, Rio. Uh, he's around 80 years old and goes stand up paddling uh, every day, the weather would allow. And uh, he is very much focused on UBI at the moment. So I think that you could have amazing conversation. And he's very well connected because he was working at the World Bank as well. So uh, I'll follow up after that. So just uh, uh, that, that's good to use the opportunity here in case anyone else is interested in UBI. I have this. Uh, Great connection. Yeah, that, that's that's super um, interesting. I mean, we're we're um, currently in the process of launching a second cohort, and I've actually are about to release um, a manual for other communities um, around the United States and the world to be able to duplicate the kind of work that we've been doing to make it kind of more cookie cutter. Um, so that because it's it's a long process of figuring it all out, including an algorithm of selection for a lottery and all that. So, but um, you know. If that's that's helpful, happy also to share. But I would love the, the context. So thank you for thinking of it. Uh, I I fear I'm not a good moderator because I have seen a bubble from Bastian and Alice uh, trying to ask questions, but I really I'm completely puzzled how to get their questions. So uh, ah, he wants the mic. How do I do that? I guess I push that. Would you have the mic here, Bastian? I've given it to him. Cool, great, thanks. I think it was my inability uh, to to figure out how this app works. So excuse me, <laughs> and uh, thanks for all of you uh, for sharing insights. Uh, um, really great panel, and now they know how the technology works. I can also uh, ask the question. Uh, uh, basically, I mean, uh, as uh, I think, uh, as it has been mentioned, there's a little bit uh, of the concern that the level of philanthropy will not keep up with the demand <laughs> that is needed. Um, and of course, uh, we can look at the typical uh, institutional uh, foundation, uh, the official development aid and so forth. But uh, I was wondering, and maybe that's actually two questions in one. First question, if you think there are like untapped pockets of like significant local philanthropy, no matter if it's institutionalized or individual in emerging countries that could be unlocked? Um, and if so, how? That's a very good question. Thank you, uh, Bastians. I hope I'm not dropping you off when I push there. Uh, not sure how I get you still in or out, but I mean... Hopefully someone can get. So who wants to reply? I mean, so the question is more an emerging market. So I think, Sylvia, you probably better posi well positions. Yeah. So despite what I said that I, I, I fear giving is, gonna, is going down, um, on the country, I think there are a lot of opportunities for more giving. If you look at the, the average person, even in the middle classes, so I'm not talking only of the ultra wealthy, most people do not give as much as they could. And it has to do with multiple reasons. Um, some of them have to do with trust in the system, trust in nonprofits. Um, even there's there's multiple motivations for philanthropy. But I do think there's a huge amount more potential. And you see that, for example, when there's a humanitarian crisis or where there's a disaster like what happened in Paris with Notre Dame, you know, uh, burning down, then suddenly philanthropists appear from different parts. And, millions of dollars, right? Um, so I do think there's a lot more potential for philanthropy. And I think people across the board can do that. And I also think that local philanthropists do it. The, the only difference is that in many developing countries or emerging markets, whatever you want to call them, philanthropy is not practiced in the same way. So it doesn't necessarily go through a legal vehicle and it's not a transfer in the form of a grant via an institution. A lot of people in, in developing countries just give directly to their neighbors, to their extended family, to situations where they see a need, um, a little bit like, like others who are given examples before that what's happening in the developed world as well. So it doesn't mean that philanthropy is necessarily lower, it just means that it's practiced in a different way and therefore doesn't get counted uh, in the same way. I always resist when people say, oh, you know, the, the people in the United States are the greatest philanthropists and the most generous people in the world. I think they are very generous, but there's generous people in every single country and there is potential in every single country to help. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, before I give the words to Alice, who's also asking for a microphone now, I think I lost her to get her, but I think you need to try again, Alice. Um, I'm sorry. I've, I, I wish you were with me in front of that dashboard of, of multiple animations. Uh, yes, she wants the mic. I'll give you the mic, and then I want to go with you, Marcello, on, on generational transfer. But please, Alice, do you have the mic? Uh, do you have the mic? Yes, yes. I do. yes, you have. Thank you very much, Etienne. I actually did not plan to, to comment. I'm here mostly to learn, but I just want to, to appreciate the panel and especially the contribution that Sylvia has just made about the different, um, a different model or way of giving that's present in emerging market. I'm speaking to you from Nairobi. So, I just want to appreciate the, the contributions I'm getting from the planet. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I see that I can remove from stage the people, but I'm not really disconnected them. So as long as no, we're not 100 on stage and we listen to each other, I prefer to keep them so I don't kick you out of the sessions. Uh, Marcello, when we were conversing and preparing the conversation today, you reminded me how important the wealth transfer would be across generations. And I think to the questions that we had before of Bastian and the comments, uh, what implication? That's more of a structural one, I mean, with the wealth transfer. Can you comment on that and give us some insight from your perspective? Yeah, thanks for that one. Uh, this started, I think, two years ago. Someone wrote an article on the greatest wealth transfer in history, and it was originally $30 billion uh, of American boomers to the um, future generations. And then someone actually calculated it for the whole world and they came up with $68 trillion being transferred over the next uh, few years slash decades. And the point that um, I made during our conversation is that I think that the current generations are fairly unprepared on how to use this money to start with. They haven't had enough experience in terms of uh, how a nonprofit is structured, uh, because in many ways it's very similar to a corporation. It's just that you, know, you can be very profitable, but the profit gets reinvested. Right? So, Wisdom Accelerator is a nonprofit. So, we uh, have had 400 speakers representing more than 100 countries, uh, you no know, sharing experiences online and how they became wiser fast in the past. That's completely free. When we have the events in Davos during the World Economic Forum, it's basically cost plus a margin to do operations, right? So whatever we make, we put back. And I would really like to see the future generations that are going to have $68 trillion and change in the bank accounts, really knowing how to use it to maximum societal impact. So it would be really ideal if we could uh, start, you know, preferably when they're teenagers, maybe when they are young adults, uh, getting them more involved with the United Nations, for instance. In a, I am the board member of a UN accredited uh, NGO, so I have the magic you know, blue badge that allows me into the, the building at a time. I've been involved with them for uh, more than five years now. And uh, you don't see family offices represented. You do see philanthropists every now and then. And uh, it, it's just absolutely fascinating. You have all those ambassadors and ministers and scientists, Nobel Prize winners, and they're there, at those UN meetings. And these are opportunities for preparedness that are being put to waste, right? It's a bit like when that plane takes off with empty seats, you cannot fill those seats again. So I really like to see people who are going to be inheriting all this wealth, trying to be better prepared on how to give. And that could be setting up their own NGO, which is very affordable. In Switzerland, it's basically free to set up an association. You just need two or three people to do that with you. And trying to have a mindset where they are learning through the NGO that is really hard. Like even to help people for free is really, really hard. I do struggle without having a massive marketing budget to tell teenagers all around the world that they can have expert opinion on how to become wiser faster uh, with the angles of a hundred different countries and different industries. I had billionaires, former uh, presidents and lots of really, really interesting people. And of course, all of you are invited to be speakers at Wisdom Accelerator anytime you want to have those sessions uh, once a month. And, um, those sessions are not well attended. 
Right. So uh, it's really hard to do that, but they're not going to realize how difficult it is not only to manage the capital that they've inherited, but also to do something that is positive for society. And they should start earlier rather than later. So if they start working with an NGO, preferably start attending UN sessions, which now are online, right? You know, most of the UN activities are happening online now. It will be a hybrid in the future. So it's really, really easy for them to be engaged at the highest levels. And they... Uh, potentially try to use this experience they gain from setting up their own NGO when they're teenagers or young adults and then shift that into a social enterprise. And they're like, this is actually for profit, right? So one of my ideas is to carry on Wisdom Accelerator as a free association organizing events in Davos and other places Venice, that's the next one. Uh, then have the foundation to grant scholarships so that uh, amazing teenagers can come to places like Davos as they have in the last two years, the two events that we organized there. But I'd also like to have a social enterprise where you can you know, help others become wiser. They don't need the help, but they just don't have access to these kind of uh, instructions from the schools where they are. So I'm trying to establish this framework of let's start at NGO, learn how hard it is, fix those problems one by one, put it all together, and then try to have in parallel a social enterprise being developed. So if you could have people who are going to be inheriting those $68 trillion going through the same process as uh, early as possible in their lives, I think the world would be a much better place you know, 10, 20 years from now. Um, can I jump Please, in on Please, go ahead. I, I fully agree with the idea that people that are going to be inheriting lots of money need to, to learn how to use that wealth for a positive impact on society. But I fundamentally disagree that the best way for them to learn is to create their own NGO. I think one of the biggest issues we have in the nonprofit and philanthropic sector is the huge dispersion of efforts. And I know it's relatively simple in Switzerland, as you rightly said, you only need 50,000 and three board members. The problem is, you know, in I give you a few numbers that I know. In the US, 1.6 million nonprofits. In the UK, 160,000 voluntary service organizations. Um, I commissioned a few years ago a report that was published by the uh, Harvard Kennedy School on global philanthropy. More than 50% of, of foundations globally have less than $1 million in assets. So what we have is a lot of funders, fund, foundations, philanthropists, doing very small gra grants, usually, very restrictive short-term small grants, to lots of NGOs all around the world, right? And Yes, this, this may be nice as a learning experiment, and it's true that we're funding innovation and we're funding pilots and all of that. The problem is that when you get a solution uh, that was created by an NGO that already is reaching hundreds of, of thousands of people, that has the potential to impact millions of lives, that has evidence of its impact, these people cannot raise the funding, right? because there's such a huge dispersion of efforts. So I, I strongly encourage people, please do not start a new NGO as a way to learn. If you want to learn, look at who's working in the field that you want to learn about. Go and volunteer with an existing NGO. Go and work with a foundation. Uh, go and learn even from academia. But do not start a new organization unless there's absolutely nobody who's doing what you want to do in this world. So Sylvia believes in aggregations of strengths rather than dispersions of initiative. Uh, Suzanne, you f I feel like you want to engage at least or so. Um, and, yeah, and I mean, Bastien, you get the words. Yeah, it's a, it's a real challenge because um, you know, we started our own not-for-profit because we wanted to be able to have the most flexibility to give to individuals as opposed to giving to existing organizations. And so I, I appreciate the fact that there are so many organizations that are probably doing duplicative efforts or kind of chasing after their own money, but that you know, and maybe there's something that has to change in the system itself that allows for much more flexibility to give to individuals um, rather than to, to organizations. Uh, I just had a, a, a corollary to the point. I uh, agree with Sylvia that uh, we shouldn't be creating NGOs just to uh, have a business card, right? So uh, uh, it's the uh, uh, difference between becoming an entrepreneur when you're very young or joining a corporation. Like, uh, it's perfectly valid to learn how NGOs operate, joining an NGO, join the board, join uh, as a volunteer. You know, I'm absolutely in agreement with you there. And the United Nations is a very good curator for NGOs that deserve support. Because if they get invited to speak at a UN meeting, they've done something right. 
right? And uh, the other thing is that some people, they're just entrepreneurs by nature. They'll never fit an environment and m maybe they're 5%, maybe they're 50%, but they need to decide by themselves. And one thing does not preclude the other. You can have an NGO that helps very locally um, with stray dogs and you invest 10, 20% of your time doing that. And then you join the board of another NGO and you try to help with the fortune you inherited with your own time and effort. So uh, I think that it, it's a very complex, but the most important thing is that they need to get into this learning curve. And most of them are not. They're just bored playing video games and you know, doing things like getting into alcohol and drugs because they're bored and they don't have guidance. And uh, this is something, and I don't want to point fingers to any communities, but uh, I, you know, I've been going to Davos for 10 years now for the World Economic Forum. And you do get to see people who should be using the potential they have in their lives more efficiently. And this is what I would like to see happening. Right? Try to get them into a, a passion and purpose track where they can figure out if this is something they really want to do. If it's, you know, uh, wisdom acceleration, something I, I did not see anywhere else. It's a very personal story because it's related to my daughter and you know, uh, our relationship. So that's why uh, a bit like Susanna felt that it had to be done. But I agree with you. Like uh, they, they need to look at multiple options and setting up your own NGO is not necessarily the, uh, the first or the most obvious one. Yeah, there is not one size fits all, but I think the interesting conversation we're having is about, you know, some level of efficiency while the work of life of philanthropy by its own way is an individual path. Uh, I want Michael to give you the opp and second opportunity to engage with us in the conversations. What does that conversation inspire you? And uh, uh, as we will get closer to the end of the sessions, I want also to hear from you. Uh, what does inspire you? Sure, thank you. Um, first thing, I'm really enjoying this discussion about the younger generation, and, and I think there's a whole spectrum along which families are engaging, um, you know, children from the age of, you know, let's say 12 to the age of 30 or, or 40, and, and part of it can just be a formal family meeting um, where, where certain aspects of the family's wealth management and philanthropic activities are shared, you know, and maybe a growing amount of those over time. Uh, but, but young people that I know are proposing charitable donations for families that already have in the U.S. either foundations or donor advised funds where there is money set aside for philanthropic purposes. And, and I think creating a structure, creating an organization where, where the young people, especially high school and college age, can start participating in what effectively is a board meeting or a management meeting starts to give them tools, skills, a sense of responsibility, and a voice in their family and in their community. So, so whether the structure is formal or informal, the fact that it has a structure and that that structure can remove kind of some of the intimidating features about getting into the world of entrepreneurship and business, uh, I think I'm agreeing in spirit with, with everything that's been said so far. The, the, so I, I have another thing to share, but maybe I'll pause there. Uh, we have five, seven more minutes, and I think one people have also asked for the word. So, uh, uh, Sandeep, would you like to raise again your hands? Because I wanted to get you in, and for some reasons uh, it didn't work. Ah, yes, now I can. Sandeep, you wanted to comment on it. Getting ready for stage. Invite on stage. Uh, I don't know. I think I gave you the words, but for some reason it doesn't work out, Sandeep. Okay. Uh, yes, Sandeep, here you are. Please, you wanted to comment. Yes, yes. Uh, good to see all of you and good to see Marcelo also. <laughs> yeah, and his we son is talking about... accelerator. Go I ahead. Just, I got it from your son. Wonderful. So, lovely, lovely. Oracis <laughs> is a community, obviously. Uh, Sandeep, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, uh, it was so nice to think about everyone uh, focusing on kids and teenagers. Uh, I have a 14-year-old son uh, who has started a for-profit company to promote social innovation and entrepreneurship and teach critical thinking innovation skills uh, to kids. And along with that, he has started his own non-profit social foundation. So he's come up with a product which can help prevent the spread of the COVID virus. Uh, while his foundation is selling it for commercial purposes, uh, the company, the social foundation, is donating it to the underprivileged, needy, and the frontline workers. How old is he? He's just 14. He just and turned 15 now. <laughs> and, and can you tell me what do you think is the best things you have done to help your son to take that initiative? 
What advice would you give to any other parents? Uh, see, uh, we, we saw it in him when he was pretty young at 11. So he's an international keynote speaker, codes in Alexa, okay. was invited by Amazon to speak when he was 12. <laughs> okay. Uh, youngest to have done three courses at Harvard and Babson as such. But however, uh, his spark came in when he spoke on innovation and the problems with the education system. And when the pandemic started, he saw the problem which is faced by everyone in the family and by his mother. And then he put all his innovation talks to work and showed that he could innovate and come up with something which can help prevent the spread of the virus and save the community. And he believes that every other child in the world can do this. And that's why he started the company, which is encouraging the other children to do it. In fact, you know, he has taught crowdfunding to more than 500, 600 students. And through them, we have raised money to donate these boxes to the underprivileged and needy. <laughs> Uh, it looks like your son is gifted, but I think you underplay the role of parents uh, because I mean, <laughs> see, as a parent, uh, yeah. as a parent, you. I think right. Suzanne wants to react. We have four more minutes, so yeah. uh, can uh, I give uh, the words? Thank you so much, Sandeep. I want to give a final you. words to everyone, but uh, your testimonials have been very inspiring. So thank you so much, Suzanne. You want to well, comment? Well, yeah, I just wanted to say that you know I think it's wonderful to support as a parent, but I think also as a philanthropist, um, we've done something similar, whereby there was a fellow in the local local community coming from a low income, low from the low income part of the of the Hudson um, named Shaheem Dahizus, who came to us and said wanted to start um, a wireless internet service provider for, for cheap broadband for the community. And so we became um, the investors in it. We, we taught them how, taught them how to launch a company. And so it's a way for us to both do philanthropy giving, but also investment in the community and someone local. Thank you for complimenting that. Uh, I think our conversation has, has been going very much into uh, intergenerationals, but also how the younger generation. So we were looking at outlook and what, how the, you know, what might be the priorities. It feels like younger generation engaging is something which is probably underplay, and I think was in that sense an, a good conversation. Uh, and I think, Marcelo, you stress that actually not the whole population is entrepreneurs, but not the whole population either is, is like to be employed. So there is a, a great tension in individualities. Uh, before before we close, since we have three more minutes, I just wanted to s make two quick rounds with really, uh, you have 20 seconds response. What brings you, the, the question of the session, there's never been better time for philanthropic giving. What is the one innovations or, or ways of giving that provide you signals for hope for changes, you know, quickly, you know, one after the others? What is the one thing in 20 seconds, Michael? I think there's three trends that are really making me optimistic about the future. One is yes. uh, consciousness that's being raised about communities in need. The second is the capital that's being raised to support those community needs, both by individuals, foundations, and corporations. And the third is the capabilities, both technological and the adjustments of certain policies, like cro cross-border medicine between states and yep. the U.S. And I think those three make me very optimistic. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Short and sharp, Sylvia. I'll, I'll give one. Yeah. I think philanthropy is finally confronting the power dynamics that are at the core of a lot of the work that we all do. Um, and I'm hoping that the changes that came about through COVID, where funders are given more flexible, more long-term, more supportive ways, are going to stay with us after yeah. the pandemic is over. Good, thank you. Marcelo, Suzanne? Uh, I think going locally, um, yes. you know, has been a certain, you know, power that really looking um, around at your community and then also um, looking at, you know, e local investment um, as well and being able to invest in local entrepreneurs to help um, help the community. Um, a friend of mine said that if you can afford to invest, if you can afford to buy a Birkin bag, they can afford to be an angel investor. And I thought that was a great way to cap it. That's a, almost the best way to close the sessions, but I think Marcelo <laughs> might have the final words. My, Marcelo? It's a quick one, just to uh, remove my teenage education hat and putting the United Nations hat. Uh, there's a huge amount of money that's being printed and uh, is very hard to access, right? The quantitative easing uh, procedures that have been going on since 2008 and now it just went completely bonkers. So in the UN meetings that I attend, you get to see lots of amazing projects that um, have money potentially allocated to them, but uh, governments are very risk averse. So what philanthropists can do is to have 
their money going into proof of concepts and pilot programs to show that, hey, this is worth the $100 million you have earmarked for that specific foundation project and actually capital. Right? So try to figure out what are the projects that are already there that are, are very nice to develop that they need government money or World Bank money, whoever is going to be fin financing that, and there are multiple organizations and institutions doing so. And try to be that trigger, right? To go there and show that this is worth doing. With a tiny little amount of money, proportionally speaking, you can unleash a huge amount of funds that can really make a difference. And I think that this is what uh, philanthropy um, right now is not the, the best time for it to act as a trigger because there's so much money out there waiting to be deployed. So much money out there, but we also hear that actually uh, there might be an uh, issue or topic that will be uh, lacking fundings uh, in the future. So I think uh, our time has elapsed and I wish we could stay longer. But uh, if I have to comment on the finals, I was uh, very interested the way our conversation took a very positive.